Good morning, students. It's Dr. Winkler again. I'm presenting a lecture in this Ancient Civilization course right now. This is a lecture that I would normally have given on the week of April 20th through 23rd. This would be the first lecture of that week. As you know, the semester doesn't end until later that week, so I will be giving you another lecture. Before we get on that, let's talk about something very important. My tie, for example. This is my Albert Einstein tie. I would like to tell you that in using this Albert Einstein tie, I'm going to present you with a brilliant lecture worthy of Albert Einstein. Too bad I can't do that. Actually, about all Albert Einstein and I have in common is we both share the first name. And my mother didn't tell me didn't tell me I was named after Albert Einstein. I was named after somebody else. In any event, let's take a look at what we're doing now. And we were talking about representative governments last time. Remember, I talked about the development of medieval democracies, uh, how people started getting their rights, and this has enormous impact in the later Middle Ages, and actually it has a great impact on us even today. Well, all right, we talk, we're getting down here to talk about representative governments. I mentioned the all thing, the oldest functioning representative government in the world. I came down and talked about Spain, the Cortes, the courts, which is a legislature as you can see function, functions for several centuries. Well, we usually don't think about the church as a <clears throat> institution that fosters democracy or representative governments. But uh, we should look at this more carefully. Um, can we say that the church, as an example, the church didn't like slavery? Uh, during the Middle Ages, the church fought against slavery, tried to end it as an institution. They had some success, not completely successful. We say that's definitely working in the right direction. Fewer slaves, more free people. Absolutely. Well, in the feudal system, uh, also known as, the, in this case, the manorial system, we see that there are serfs. This is serfdom. Serfs that actually are controlled by the, by the lords, the landowners. Now, the church is a major landowner. It's a major landowner all over Europe. I mean, it's absolutely huge in some areas. In some countries, like England, we say maybe one third of all the land was owned by the church. This is largely true of France as well. In places like Bohemia, which is the modern day Czech Republic, we have reason to believe that the church owned half the land. How do they get this? Well, <clears throat> you get these from people putting their wills, well, I'm gonna die. How about having something a little sweet uh, to send to humanity, to help me get into a better place on the other side. And so they donate land, property, and land to the church. Over time, this could add it be quite a bit. That's one way they get They can purchase it as well. Now, there are serfs working the land on these areas that the church owns. And the reputation, if you will, for the treatment of serfs on church land is superior, in fact, if you had a choice between being a serf on a, an estate owned by a nobleman or on a estate owned by the church, you're probably better off if you are on land that is owned by the church. You, you, you will be treated better. <clears throat> Something else we need to mention as well, and the church has ideas of equality. Let's describe that a little bit better. The who can become a priest, for example. Now, the pious parish priest is probably the most respected man in Europe. And there are tens of thousands of them in various countries. Uh, we believe that in France, there are 30 or 40,000 priests, a very large number. Uh, and they're looking after you know, millions of people. In any event, <clears throat> uh, where do the priests come from as a social class? They come from the peasants, the poorest people. 
what do you have to be to become a priest? Well, certain things you have to, certain criteria you have to meet. One is you, you can't be a criminal. Uh, okay, this is pretty bad. You don't, you want a criminal taking confessions. That's right. Um, you can't be maimed. You can't be disfigured. You can't be missing an arm or leg. So that's another factor. And slaves, you could, you could be a serf, but you couldn't be a slave. Slave could not be a priest. So there's a large segment of society of the very lowest classes that are, in fact, parish priests. And sometimes these men have to at least have a, rudim a rudimentary understanding of reading and writing to be able to function well in the liturgy, to be able to read scripture, to be able to read a oration in front of the parish. Um, these, this is a, an enclave of learning. And in the Middle Ages, a lot of times, if you wanted to learn something, if a school was not available, you would go to a priest, and the priest knew, knew had some learning. If he was a well-educated priest, he had a lot of learning, and he could teach you how to read and write and other things that you might need to know. Okay. All right, so we start out with the priests from lower classes. I have up here social mobility. <clears throat> social mobility, obviously, you move up the social scale. Um then one of the next rungs higher than the parish priest within the hierarchy of the church is bishops. The bishop would be over thousands of people. It's a very, very a large group of people. And uh, many bishops, perhaps not all. You see, the higher up you go within the hierarchy, the more the nobles would like to participate. Quite frankly, there's more money involved. But and power and authority as well. <clears throat> so you have many bishops. Many bishops are actually priests, and many of, the, of course, the priests come from the lower classes. Uh, some nobles show up there, but still a lot of priests. Now you get the area of archbishops. Archbishops are very large, a very large and powerful office. For example, in England, there are two archbishops, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, just two of these for the entire nation of England. There are two archbishops in Germany, for example. Um, we can say the nobles are very, very heavy, heavily represented here. They are, uh, some of these, uh, relatively small in numbers, uh, are actually from priests, from bishops, and others from the lower classes. The highest level of the secular clergy in Catholicism is the Pope, the Holy Father in Rome. Several popes. One book I read said there were four. What I feel bad about is the author didn't list any of these. So uh, I decided to, from my knowledge and did a little research, uh, I found three. Gregory VII, very important early pope, as far as in the investiture controversy. In other words, in Germany, there's an issue who's going to choose the church leaders. And if the state, if the German emperor chooses these leaders, then they will actually do his bidding. So this is an issue of control. Well, uh, Gregory, lower class. Adrian IV, lower class. Perhaps the best example is Celestine V. What is this guy doing? He, he's he's a monk. He lives in a rock, a cave, whatever, a small, very, very, shall we say, challenging dwelling outside of Rome. Uh, he was well-renowned for his piety and his service to the Lord. It's very, very nice. And they choose him, low-class person, having hold no administrative function in the church, is now chosen, chosen, it's now chosen uh, to be the Pope. His situation is almost unique. He's pope for all what, about five months, and for a number of reasons, uh, <clears throat> some people think that maybe some chicanery was involved. That he was, uh, some people try to uh, make him nervous about his situation. Anyway, he resigns after five months, um, lives his last what two years of his life. Uh, going back to the kind of life that he had known before. 
Now, in the in the 20th century, so Benedict the 16th, I guess 21st century, we do have another pope that has actually retired. It's actually stepped down, and um, in any event that has happened, but maybe twice in the entire history of the papacy. Okay, but we do see examples here, very strong examples of social mobility within the church. Yes, we can talk about a hierarchy, but the hierarchy is not fixed. And if the church reflects this, can we say that this might also spill over into other areas of medieval society? And we can make that statement. Well, um, we want to make a religious statement on this. And there is a scripture in the book of John, John chapter 1, verses 9. And the Spirit is the true light that gives light to everyone. Now, some translations say every man, uh, and that's probably the way it states in the original Greek. But we would clearly interpret every man as being everyone, every person. There's a Spirit within all of us that comes directly from the Lord. And the Lord, sometimes we call it our conscience, it goes inside our brains, and it is innate sense of right and wrong. That's why, that's why we know we shouldn't do bad things. And of course, the church instruction, other moral teachings can give us a pretty good indication that we shouldn't do bad things. But on the other hand, we have a direct gift within our souls from deity on how on what is right and what is wrong. If you have this within you, can you not be trusted to make decisions? If you have this within you, cannot you be trusted to function in government, to function in a democracy, to function in a representative government? Because if you follow your conscience, you're following the will of the Lord. One thing else I should mention before I get off this topic uh, is the church is even more revolutionary than anything I'm saying right here. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I do not have time to talk about uh, more than just small areas of medieval history. It's literally vast. And church history in the Middle Ages is also vast. One of the things, however, which I want to mention, is that there was a situation where you have more than one pope. So we say contending popes. Uh, we call this the Great Schism. It ran until 1378 to 1417. Uh, what had happened is this. We have a claimant to be a pope living in Avignon, France, southern part of France. And we have another claimant to be the pope living in Rome. And the, shall we say, the case for each one of these men is strong enough that it's very, very difficult to decide who on earth is the actual pope. So the church calls a council, Council of Pisa. Pisa comes forward, Pisa comes forward and says, oh, by the way, uh, we'll depose both the popes, and we'll choose somebody else. The difficulty is these men don't stand out. Now you got three. Okay, well, let's have the Council of Constance. Can I get you a, an illustration here? Constance is a city way south of Germany, right on Lake Constance. It's... Uh, exists from 1414 to 1418. The council realizes there is a major problem that we have popes that are, or claimants to be popes, are vying with each other for the authority of the church. And it's the council coming to resolve this issue. And one of the ways they decide to resolve this is to place the council above the Pope. <clears throat> the council essentially says this, that we are representative. I mean, the council is the, the leaders of the church. These are archbishops. These are bishops that come from all over Europe and represent, shall we say, the body of Jesus Christ. The Pope might represent the head, but According to the council, the body is superior to the head. In any event, they pass a couple of bulls, papal, not papal bulls, but they're official statements coming out of the council. One is called Hexancta, 
which literally means this holy. And they usually name bowls after the first words or the first few words in this case of the document itself. Well, Hank Sanctus says that the council is now superior to the Pope. This document is absolutely revolutionary. We have a representative um, council. Maybe I shouldn't call this a government. We have a representative council that now comes forward and says, we are superior to the leader. In other words, if you wanted to transport that over to the state, that a representative government, a legislative council, if you will, is actually superior to the king. Hexanct is a very important document. Another one is followed up. You see, if you have the council and the council doesn't meet, how does it control the church? So rather than having this a institution that exists very infrequently, maybe one every hundred years, um, it does not exist very often, believe me. You should have this exist frequently. Uh, so another bowl comes out of this is called Hake, no, I said Hake Sancta. This is called frequent, frequent, frequently. In other words, the council has to be a permanent institution and it has to continue to meet to oversee what's happening with the Pope. Revolutionary documents, extremely important. Well, let's look at how this works out in some other states. Uh, the estates general in France. Remember the king needs money. And the king's got a big, big problem during over 100 years of this. They're fighting the 100 years war. Uh, during wartime, you tend to need an awful lot of money. Well, the king is willing to call the estates general to get advice, information on how to get more money. Uh, the estates are the three estates. They are the clergy, the highest estate, nobility, they're obviously very high, the peasantry. Uh, the medieval civilization is a little bit more complex than sometimes we uh, represent it. If you're not clergy nobility, not everybody's a peasant. There are merchants, there are traders, there are people involved in manufacturing, and uh, there are lawyers, there are scribes. There's a lot of people that we set, tend to put within the rubric of peasantry. Yes, we can call it peasantry, but in reality, it's virtually everybody else. Well, as you can see, it doesn't last but 300 years. It weeks out in 1610. The reason for this is... Henry IV or Henri Le Grand of France decides, I got enough power, I don't need to go to this council. So when the king has enough power, it, it, it literally doesn't need this. Uh, one of the reasons why this is worth mentioning is that in 1789, there's an attempt, in other words, another estates general is called, hadn't met since 1610, and usually the calling of the estates general in 1789 we use as the turning point, as the beginning of the French Revolution. That's beyond the scope of this course, but there is representative governments functioning here. Federal dais assemblies, um, the Holy Roman Empire, which is largely the uh, uh, some very important leaders, there's nine men, and that's going to function until like 1806. When uh, Napoleon comes in and says, Anthony, let's get rid of all this. Switzerland, however, ha has another interesting example. It's called the Tagsatzung. In other words, the, you get representatives from the various cantons, the various Swiss states, and they meet in a rotating basis between three cities, usually Zurich, Lucerne, and Basel. And they come together and decide issues of usually defense and foreign policy. This has somewhat altered over time. In, in fact, what you have is now, rather than rotating the meeting of this body, uh, the capital of Switzerland, as you know, is Bern, so its legislature meets there. But this, these medieval assemblies, these federal diets, in Switzerland still exists. It just evolved slightly over the centuries. Perhaps our best example is England. 
England in the 13th century got civil wars going on. And it's a rough and tough time frame. It's a rough time frame. And uh, there's a member named Simon de Montfort. And he's rebelling against the king and he needs support. So he calls a representative government because Simon de Montfort's part of it. And he gets together in 1265. And what he's trying to do is get support from the state. He needs money to fight the king. Now, this is unusual. Use the king that calls the parliament. This doesn't last very long, only like a year. But the king looks at this example. This is Henry III. And he decides, you know something? This is a pretty good idea. I still need money. I still need the help from various people that, in, that have money. So he continues to call parliament. Sometimes every year, sometimes every three years. Uh, there are times in the 17th century where Parliament is not even called for like 11 years. But it, then it's recalled, then you end up with the English Civil War in the 1640s. But what I'm trying to point out is this. Though it is, there's a lot of developments going to go on here. But this institution still exists. Even as we sit here having this discussion. Parliament, a medieval institution still exists and it is still the governing body England is a lot bigger than it used to be of Britain or the United Kingdom so a lot of our representative governments do go back to the Middle Ages uh, let's move on and talk about a different topic at this point uh, let's take a look at art and architecture uh, I always get excited about art Yes, historians, you mentioned primary source historians and our palms sweat. The sources are there and you really, you know, your blood pressure goes up and all these kind of wonderful things happen. Well, I like art. I'm not an art historian, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. It doesn't mean I don't know anything about it. I know a little bit about it. <clears throat> the last time we discussed art, we were talking about the Pantheon in Rome. Remember that? And a nice, brilliant dome structure. I didn't say, however, that is the apex or the most important or most brilliant dome structure at this time frame because we have competitors. And let's look at the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia was built in Constantinople. Remember what Constantinople was when Diocletian and later Constantine divided the Roman Empire into two pieces. They decided that they, that they needed a capital in the east as well as the west. Uh, later on, we would call this city Istanbul after the Muslims take it in 1453. That's way down the road. This time frame is Constantinople. Should we put that on the map? Make sure I know, make sure you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, it's modern Istanbul. Let's just take you out and show you where it's at. It's in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, Rome is not a good place to defend because it's essentially out on a, on a banks of a river. Um, when the Germanic invasions are coming in, they realize that you've got a problem, it's hard to defend. So for a while, they actually moved the capital of Rome, not out of Rome, up to Ravenna, which is up here. In the eastern Mediterranean, as you can see, this is on a peninsula. <clears throat> And it's much more defensible. It's also on a very good trade route when you're having trade goods going between Europe and Asia. So the reasons why it's so very wealthy. And so it's it's right here. Well, <clears throat> this is the capital Eastern Empire. And the Byzantines, we call the Eastern Roman Empire the Byzantine Empire. Um, and Hagia Sophia means holy wisdom, they create a magnificent dome. 
Originally, the structure did not have the minarets. See these fun little minarets right here. <clears throat> they were built later, after 1453, when the Muslims came in. And I'm not a good art, his, art, art critic or historian, but uh, some art historians have looked at this and saying, you know, you start out with this dome, this literally magnificent dome. And if you wanted to have something external to make it look very good, these minarets, these minarets on each corner would be an excellent way of doing that. So can we say this enhances the art? Though it was not the original idea. The length of the dome. 290, 269 feet. That's big. It's almost the length of a football field. It is a very big building. <clears throat> 240 feet wide. 184 feet high. Whoa! That's over 50 yards. That's, that is way up. <clears throat> well, let's look at the interior. I'd like to get a floor plan for it. I can do this right. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm not sure which is the best one. Uh, the concept is actually a dome within a dome. You have the major dome structure, but as we look at the, and I muck myself up, as we look at the interior, do you not get a sense that we have the major dome, which is right here, but off on the side, like alcoves, you have domes as well. So you have domes on the external, and you have the major dome, which actually goes over the top. Uh, the effect of this is actually quite, quite stunning. <clears throat> you see, the time frame this is built, we don't have anything like reinforced steel construction. When, the re when you and I have reinforced steel construction, we can actually have support within a building and have large windows because the walls are not needed for support. Well, in this kind of structure, the walls are needed for support because you have to have a lot of masonry there. You have to have a lot of stone. There's going to be a very big problem as far as light is concerned. Now, the Gothic is going to deal with that in its own way. We'll talk about that in a little while. But at this time frame, look what we have here. Around the dome, we actually have a whole series of windows. If you're alive when this is built for at least a thousand years, way after that as well, you walk into this and it, the effect is literally magnificent because on a clear day, the light is coming through there and it's almost like the dome is floating on a pillar of light. Uh, that can be really quite, quite stunning. Well, how do you do this? I'm sorry, I just, too much temptation. <laughs> it's too much fun to just look at various representations here. Let's see if I can give you a better view on the external structure. Uh, can I get a closer view of that? Maybe not as good as I would like. Can you see, and I hope this isn't too challenging, can you see that you have the windows, but between each window you have Stone, stone structures, like sticking out of ways. In other words, the weight of the dome comes down. It does not have to use the window space because right next to that are these, I want to call them stone pillars, it's probably not accurate, but this stone abutment or stone support. So, uh, This is a brilliant, a brilliant mechanism by which you can support the structure. <clears throat> well, initially they had to do a little bit of experimentation. By that I mean a few decades after the initial dome was constructed, the whole thing crashed to the ground. Well, what, did that, what happened? What we think had happened was this, the pitch, the angle of the dome was actually too flat. On the basis of that, it simply would not hold it and it dropped. So when it was reconstructed, the dome structure was elevated 
it's up higher. It still has this magnificent effect of, of literally sitting on a pillar of light. But in reality, this has become extremely valuable in maintaining the structure. One of the things we need to remember about Istanbul, and Turkey for that matter, this is earthquake country. My goodness, they have shakes very frequently. Just a few years ago, they had a major earthquake, I believe its epicenter was down by Ankara, which is the capital, the center part of Anatolia, which did severe damage. Well, you're shaking in a lot of places. The palace where the emperor lived is actually nearby. And what the palace did, what they decided to do to, to uh, uh, keep the structure as viable as possible, these huge masonry walls, I mean, my goodness, stone, really, really big. And when it shakes, it breaks, it cracks. So this structure has not done very well. But the Hagia Sophia, of course, every time there's an earthquake, the experts are in there, they're measuring, they're looking around for virtually 900 years. I'm way off. Well, uh, 1,400 years. This structure has withstood earthquake after earthquake after earthquake. Now, those of you from California are probably very familiar with this because California has a San Andreas Fault, and of course, there's frequent earthquakes down there. And the buildings that are built in many places in California have to fit, have to fit a certain building code, and that is they give. If you have a strong structure and everything shakes, it'll break it apart. But so there's give within the buildings, and sometimes even the buildings have a little bit of rollers, so they'll, sometimes the entire building will shift. That's not exactly, but it's similar to what we see in the Hagia Sophia. Within this structure, rather than being rigid, there's enough give. So even though they had to rebuild the dome at one point, the when they rebuild it, it has give. And there's also give within the external, the dome within the dome, on the, ex, on the exterior, which allows us to survive. It is big, it is beautiful, it's magnificent. And it is one of the architectural wonders of its age. <clears throat> Something else which we read about during the Middle Ages are the, let's close some of these off, uh, are the illuminated manuscripts. This is an art form that we are not using very much today. Um, we have print mechanisms that'll do that. Let's look at some of these early Middle Ages, some of these early medieval uh, illuminated manuscripts. Remember Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne was that monastery up in the northeast of England that was subject to raids by the Vikings early on in the Viking Age. And remember, the, the monasteries are easy pickings for the, for the Vikings. Well, the Lindisfarne Gospels fortunately have survived. Uh, the uh, book cover is an artistic masterpiece. Can I get a bigger view of that? In any event, it's an artistic masterpiece. You can see precious jewels and precious metals involved. On the interior of the book, we see illuminations. Um, so you can get an appreciation for what they're able to do. These are some monks working sometimes under harsh conditions, sometimes a little cold in the room, and uh, using various colors of ink, using literally pen and ink, uh, to create some of the most magnificent uh, illuminated manuscripts ever, ever. Sometimes the Book of Kells is considered to be the most beautiful book ever, ever created. It is in Dublin at Trinity College. A few years ago, I've already mentioned, I broke the piggy bank. <clears throat> and I talked my son into going on a bus tour of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And we pulled into Dublin. <clears throat> Very high on my list of what to do was 
see the Book of Kells. And uh, our tour guide said, yes, over here in Trinity College. And we had a new an hour and had an hour and a half to get something to get back to the bus. <clears throat> well, I'm heading straight over to Trinity College and I'm paying whatever I have to to see this book. Uh, I have been told that you'd have to go back day after day to see all of it. And your entrance is not free. Uh, since entrance is not free, uh, I don't know how much you'd have to pay to see the entire thing. Um, it was a little bit more than I wanted. You come in, they say, oh, here's what many manuscripts are all about. Yeah, I'm not a complete idiot. Yes, I do have <laughs> a knowledge of this already. What I really want to do is see the book. Well, uh, I did spend some time looking around. Yes, re it's uh, giving me information. Some of this I, I either didn't know or forgotten. So it was really worth the effort. I shouldn't disparage it too much. But uh, when you got in the room, I thought the Book of Kells would be something like this. It was not. It was more like that. And uh, they didn't have, it's on, it's on a table. <clears throat> and you try to see it. And rather than having a line going past it, you kind of congregate around it. So, yeah, I didn't really see it right side up. I get to see it upside down. We get across the table and look at it. I, I can very... Uh, honestly say I've seen it. But on the other hand, if you want to get a really appreciation of what it's like, we do need to look at photographs. We do need to look at reproductions. And uh, this is a capital letter, I believe, beginning on one of the Gospels. If I could bring that a little bit larger, let me try this down here. What we see both in the Lindisfarne Gospels and in the Book of Kells are very intricate patterns. And I'm sorry, I really can't. I'm not being successful in getting this larger. I'll try it one more time, then I'll give up. Okay. I'm giving up. Um, if you follow this carefully, you can see that there are inclines going in various directions. <clears throat> And if you follow them correctly, and some of them go under other inclines, some of them disappear under areas of other writing, other calligraphy. If you follow them carefully, and there are many scores of these on one page, you'll find that they are consistent. If you follow the line of this with your eye, it might disappear here, reappear here, disappear over here, reappear over there. Uh, just the layout of this would ab be absolutely, extremely difficult to do. But then the actual construction of the book is quite stunning. Let's go back and talk about the issue of the Dark Age. And once again, if you're going to call the early Middle Ages a Dark Age, you do have to take into account that among the most magnificent of this art form, that has ever been produced is early, is early Middle Ages. Something else the, the Middle Ages are quite known for are mosaics. Now, while I'm messing around here, do I, let me tell you a story about the Book of Kells. <clears throat> there is a story that it was stolen at one point. Some thief got in and grabbed it and ran off with it. Of course, the monks are terrified. This brilliant treasure might be lost. And, and they found it in a field <clears throat> where the thief had actually taken the cover off. Remember, gold and jewels. That's what the thief wanted. And this is manuscripts to start. Maybe it's a lot easier to sell gold and jewels than it is to sell art. That's probably the case. In any event, the book was found in the field and it was retrieved very fortunately for us. Uh, mosaic is another thing that we see as a medieval art form. <clears throat> Mosaics are colored glass, usually. Sometimes they'll put gold in with this as well. And in that case, in the Middle Ages, you'd have a piece of clear glass. You put gold underneath it and you cement another piece of glass underneath it. So the effect is gold which is one of my favorite colors. <laughs> you got a lot of gold around. It really looks good. Well, 
you see what a mosaic is here. You see colored glass. And if you're going to make a, a coherent picture with this, the size of the glass has to, the size of these pieces, I should say, has to be very small. One of the more stunning examples of this is San Vitale in Ravenna. Just a few minutes ago, I was telling you that for a while at least, the Romans moved the capital of Rome from Rome to the city of Rome to Ravenna. It's more defensible. It's out on a peninsula. It's harder to attack. San Mattel, let's get Ravenna out here. So we are not too surprised that some work could be done as far as artistic representations are concerned. Uh, unfortunately, I have not been to this one. I have not seen this one. But the interior is really what we want to look at. So let's look at the mosaics. In an alcove, notice that we have gold. Love gold. Now, we can say, well, look at all the gold up there. If we were to steal this, we could make a lot of money. Uh, probably not. I've been told that if you had an ounce of gold, and of course the price of gold is really high, uh, if you had an ounce of gold and you just smashed it down, it would could cover about 42 square feet. So you don't have to have a great deal of gold to produce this. But you can imagine, of course, when you have small sheets of gold, that it can roll up on you, it can present some problems. So uh, the artist, art, artistry involved is really quite remarkable. Now uh, I can't see this very closely. This is probably the Lord and Savior and this is probably some angels around him. I'm guessing because I don't know. Uh, this area was owned by the Byzantine Empire uh, until uh, into the 6th century, into the 500s. And now we have the Roman Emperor here, Justinian, which is the man in the center, that's supposed to be purple because purple was a royal color. And uh, this is supposed to be a, one of the more brilliant things that are there. Now, he had a girlfriend, his wife, and she's also represented here. So you can look at her a little bit closer. That's a better shot. Um, as you can see, the halo around here, which is probably done in gold, looks like gold. Uh, but if we could zoom in on the face, the size of the tiles would be extremely small because there's a lot of very good detail here. The uh, Byzantines in the early Middle Ages excel in the use of mosaics. Okay. Now let's move back to architecture. Architecture, of course, is buildings. And there is the Basilica, see, which I have right here. The Basilica is the Roman administration building. And you say, wait, we're talking about Rome. How does that influence medieval art? Well, what the Christians had tried to do, remember I did mention this in passing when we were talking about the reasons why Rome fell. And one of the arguments is Christianity brought it down. Remember, I did mention that one of the weaknesses in that argument is that the church was trying to support, trying to support the government in almost every way they possibly could. And there's a shadow government almost. You have the civil government, which is Roman, and you have the church government, which is obviously church. When the civil government gone is gone, the church is still here. And the sometimes these the church and state were actually functioning fairly closely together. And the church has a tendency to take over the administrative buildings that were used by the state. And the Basilica is a Roman administration building. I'll give you some images on basilicas. Yeah, <laughs> maybe not the best. 
Yes, we do call St. Peter's Basilica, which is the head of, head building in the Catholic Church in the Vatican right now. We do call it a basilica. Uh, I'm using that slightly different. Let me get a Roman basilica. Not as helpful as I want. Okay. Let's go directly for the juggler. Let's go for St. Paul outside the walls. Uh, outside the walls means it's actually outside the walls of Rome, the city itself. It was a basilica, an administration center, and it is considered to be one of the more stunning examples of a Roman basilica that's been, shall we say, reinvented um, as a Christian church. Let's get an interior shot. I have been there. I've seen it. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. How good can this possibly be? You know, this is kind of early in the Middle Ages. Uh, wow. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> when I got in, got in and the exterior of the building, as you can see right here, and I got inside the building and go, oh my goodness, was I ever wrong about that? It has a central nave running down the middle. As you can see, these are Roman columns. Can I give you a better shot of that? These are Roman columns. And you walk down there. Unfortunately, of course, this is the high altar. If you get close enough to that, which I wish I could, you actually have a representation of Jesus on it, on the throne. Now, that's not terribly surprising. Is that helpful here? Uh, now, we're kind of back to where we were before. Um, any event, if you, and if you ever get here, and please, if you get the chance, please go. You will not regret it. But you get inside here and actually have paintings here, the various apostles. Uh, <clears throat> Other uh, important people in Christianity, um, very very nice. Uh, can't share the high altar, but you can see this this magnificent structure, and you can see how beautiful it is going down the nave. Okay, what is the ceiling? I mean, having a flat ceiling with stone is really not impo is really impossible at this time frame. It was made out of wood, and as you know, wood is basically carbon. As wood ages, it tends to go back toward carbon. There's something which we call spontaneous combustion, where if the, if the wood actually deteriorates enough, it can actually start producing heat in the decomposition process, I guess you'd call it, and then it can actually start a fire. A few centuries ago, it burned. It didn't burn the exterior because it's made of stone. It did burn the ceiling. So, using what they knew about the, the structure, and they knew quite a bit, obviously this had been examined for many, many years, uh, the authorities in Italy were able to reconstruct this, and we think perhaps this is very, very close to how it looked originally. Once again, I love gold, and gold's right here. So, let's see, get a basilica floor, floor plan if I can find one. You say this is a simple basilica right here. Can I get a bigger one? It's easier to look at. How about that one? Uh, not terribly better. But remember, this is what we saw in St. Paul's Outside the Walls. Uh, you have the central nave going here. I did show you the columns. Uh, when this was an administrative center by the Romans, you would actually have your administration taking place right here. Well, this becomes the high altar. This is where you have... Uh, have Mass, and this is where you uh, hand out the Holy Eucharist. Um, you can see somewhat, can you not, that this is somewhat looks like a cross. Christians like the cross. In the West, this is the Western Christianity, you do have a tendency to see things in a manner that look a lot like a cross. Since, as we know from our teachings, Jesus is supposed to come back from the East when he does come back, this is usually oriented on an east-west basis, this being east, the high altar being therefore closer to the 
return of Jesus. Now we get to Romanesque. We say the basic idea is this, but as we extend it, let's take a look at what the Romanesque looks like. Romanesque, as you could well imagine, looks, uh, it means Roman-like. Okay, So actually you're taking the basilica, now you're going to expand it. Okay, let's get something here. These are exterior views of Romanesque churches, which still exist. I wanted to get an interior view to give you an idea of what direction we're going in. I'm not sure that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, notice there's been a change, however. Uh, we still have Roman columns right here. This happens to be in Italy. Roman columns right here. But the arches now, should you make a comparison again? The arches are fairly small, but now we're going up. And we're seeing that the arches are higher. There's one in Normandy. Sometimes we call it Norman in construction. Construction. I want a little more interior. Uh, is that helpful? Yeah, it is. See, the trouble is showing you some of these things. Later on, they actually have Gothic elements on some of these churches. I believe it is that Rouen, the Rouen Cathedral. I'll try it one more, then I'll give up. So you can get the interior, an interior shot. I've never been to Rouen. I would like to go for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that's where they burned Joan of Arc. Well, <clears throat> of course, she's a national hero. Not only is she a Christian saint, but she's a national, a national hero. Well, maybe this is about as good as I'm going to do. Notice what's happened now. The ceilings are higher. Notice that the structures, the structures are still very large. Um, can we say this looks a little bit dark? Yes, it does, because we have to have all this masonry to support the structure. Uh, are these big and beautiful? Yes, they are. Notice the vaulting. Let's go back here. The vaulting is still largely round, much like the vaulting which we see in Rome. And remember, this allows them, turning the vault around, to actually create uh, a dome. Well, okay. Um, Roman arch, semicircular. And remember, we talked earlier about the aqueducts influencing what's going on. In this case, you have arch on arch not dissimilar to what we actually see in, in aqueducts. So we do believe that is, that is, that is a function. Well, um, after a while, after a century or two, um, architects are experimenting. And uh, they... start to do some other things architecturally. And they invent the Gothic. Now, I have to admit, uh, Gothic is my favorite art form. Yeah, I like art. I like all kinds of art. I have seen a couple of Romanesque churches. I was blown away by St. Paul's outside the walls. But in reality, if you look at the things that really light my fire, the Gothic really has everything beat. The ribbed vault. So we can get give you some examples of Gothic architecture. Uh, can we look at the interior? See ribbed vault. Bad idea. Okay, on the exterior of the of a Gothic church, 
Notice what we have here is a support structure. We have these uh, stones, this is stones, that has to be laid down enormously carefully. And they simply come up, as you can see, as supports. It's beautiful as well, obviously. But they, this structure now it makes it possible to have a less heavy roof. Uh, so rib vaulting is very important in understanding. The pointed arch, the Gothic arch. is a pointed arch. Uh, here's a good example just like this. A Romanesque arch is going to look like that. A Gothic arch is going to be pointed. We see the Moors in Spain using a pointed arch first. They use that in some of their buildings. But the idea goes into France and other places, Germany, Italy, and England, as, as well as other places. And shall we say it takes architecture by storm. You now have something that is much stronger than this kind of arch, which was largely used at the Romanesque. Let me show you an example of how to tell how strong this is. Take your hands like I'm doing right now and make yourself a Romanesque arch. Put it underneath your chin and push down. You can tense your fingers if you want to, but it's fairly easy for you to push that down. In other words, it is less rigid. Now take your fingers and make a Gothic arch. Put your fingers together like that. And then put that underneath your chin and push down. I don't even have to tense my fingers because I push down, the fingers push together, and you can see it is much stronger in construction. Once again, buildings can be higher. They can use less masonry to support the structure. And the, fly, the famous flying buttress. This is an external support for a wall. Um, this is really quite remarkable in many respects. We're used, you're used to think of heavy masonry. Going back to the Romanesque, heavy masonry are probably way beyond where ought to be. Heavy masonry supporting the structure. It has to be heavy. But because the weight is coming down, what if you put the support outside the walls rather than on the interior? Whoa, that takes some genius. The architects realized that if you have a wall, if you have a structure, and it collapses, it tends to break or bow out and break in certain critical points, usually two, here and here. So rather than supporting the entire structure all up and down the walls, you just have to support it at critical positions. In this case, where it's going to break or bow out, which happens to be here and here. So now you take your external support, take your external support and place it right where it needs to be. So the big thick masonry walls do not have to exist. And what you now have are windows. Rather than having heavy masonry to support everything that keeps the building dark. Yeah, you're going to have candles and lamps on the inside. In reality, that's not going to light it very well. But now you have the ability to have a lot more light coming in. One, uh, let's give you a few examples here in a few places. One of the most famous of these flying buttresses is actually Notre Dame de Paris. And as you know, was it just last year? 
the thing caught on fire. Oh my goodness. One of my plans before I die is to <laughs> go back uh, and, and see Notre Dame again. I saw it 35, 40 years ago. Um, I do have some very nice memories of it. Unfortunately, it was a cloudy day, so I couldn't really get the impact of light coming through the windows. Uh, I would like to revisit this. As you know, very unfortunately, the thing burned. And it was a fire hazard, and it's an accident waiting to happen. Uh, let's go back and look at the flying buttress. This is one of the things it's famous for. Notice that the entire structure is supported by flying buttresses. Uh, the nation of France has said that we're going to rebuild this as fast as we can. We're going to get this back up and going in five years. Let's hope they do it. And uh, hopefully it will still exist. It will be rebuilt by the time I get back to France again, if I ever do. Okay, so we have flying buttresses higher, longer, wider. I do have a few examples. Let's see if I, yeah, down here. Now I'll talk about them when I get down there. Higher, wider, longer. Some of the Gothic cathedrals in Britain are like 500 feet long in the nave. Whoa. Uh, it seems like in England, there's a tendency to have long naves. In France, however, you like higher ceilings. The nave is still there, of course, but the ceilings are quite a bit higher. So as, as the nations, the various cultures involved in Europe, uh, tend to interpret the Gothic slightly different for everybody else. So walls thinner, like stained glass windows. Let's see if I can go back and probably won't do the right thing. Let's go back and look at Um, all right. So some Gothic stained glass windows. The magnificence of these things should not be overlooked. My goodness, they're beautiful. I would like to show you one of the more famous ones. That's it right here. That's what I was looking for, actually. Um, when the Gothic is actually invented, some of the earliest buildings that were built by the architects were, were in Paris. And uh, this is a room, I have been in here, which actually shows the Gothic. Now, notice it has elements of the Gothic. The, the, the structure has the pointed arches. And I did a bad mistake like I used to do. And we have the structure, we have the rib vaulting, we have the point, pointed arch. But because of this, the support, we now have these magnificent glasses. And this is just literally colored stone, it's colored stone, colored glass. And you make the glass and you put it together, something like a mosaic. And it literally fills the room with light and the light can be heavily colored. Let's take a look at one of the the churches that is very, very famous for stained glass window. And that's the Chartres. Very fortunately, I have visited this as well. Um, there is a architectural change going on here. This is a shot cathedral. This is a Romanesque tower. So obviously they completed this tower before we have the Gothic coming. So you complete this tower in Romanesque, you complete the second tower in Gothic. The Gothic is a busy style. There's a lot going on here. When I was taking art history class many years ago, and I'm sure there's a technical term for this, but the one I remember from the art historian is, look at all the gingerbread, <laughs> all these things sticking out in various places. Um, 
some of the more magnificent. Let's go here and get the stained glass. When you walk into a Gothic building, you walk in the doors, you turn around, and above you is what they call the rose window. Since the churches are almost always oriented directly on east and west, the rose window is going to be, rose window is going to be on the west side of the building. If you want to visit this and see it in its magnificence, come in the afternoon because that's where the sun is. And I remember being here. Yes, I've been to Charlotte. And oh, I had a fun time. Because when it was in the afternoon, the light was coming through the windows, and it hit on the floor. Now, remember, these things are like 80 feet above the ground. So the angle, so this the, the turning of the earth, which gives us the impression that the sun is actually moving, uh, shifts sometimes quite noticeably. In other words, you see the glass, the colored light hitting the floor. And as you watch it, you can almost see it move. And as it moves, as the angle of the sun becomes different going through the glass, it's like ever so suddenly you can see a change in color, a change in hue, a change in intensity. Uh, the effect of this can be quite magnificent. On the exterior walls by the nave, we have another example of magnificent stained glass windows. Now, I can't give you a, sh a closer view, but... Uh, Let's try that. You see there's something going on here. Um, there is, looks like maybe the Lord enthroned. Maybe there's an angel here. You see, most of the people in the Middle Ages are illiterate. But if you're given instruction as to what these things mean, and you walk in the church and go, well, I can read the story. You can read it up. You can read it across, however it's done. There is a number of these things going down the nave. However, apparently the interpretation of these things was not well written down. So what we're actually seeing here is a book we can no longer read. When I was there, remember this is close to 40 years ago, when I was there, our tour guide said, we've only deciphered one of these successfully. They're working on the others, and he pointed to another one. We think we understand most of this one. Uh, I would like to see if they've actually been able to decipher them. But you can see, because of this, there's a level of complexity uh, in the stained glass, which is quite remarkable. The, there is some controversy. These things have been cleaned. Uh, a lacquer was placed on them to preserve them so there wouldn't be much deterioration. And people say the lacquer that was put on has distorted it, and the light is a little bit different than it was. Be that as it may, it's really quite, quite stunning, what I was able to see. I've already talked about the, oh, the rose window. I did mention that. And that is the window that happens to be above the entrance, the facade of the building. And if we look back at our floor maps, which is largely on a cross, the center part is the nave. The cross is the transept. On either side of the transept, you will also see rose windows. So there's not just one in the building, there's actually usually three. And here's, well, a uh, good example of rose windows. Some of these are stunning, different colors, uh, different representations. <clears throat> Well, Notre Dame, I already talked about the famous flying buttresses. Um, Reim, Reim, how do you say it in French? Rhin. Uh, Rhin in, in, in France. And I have seen this one as well, much more recently. Like a fool, I rented a car. Bad idea. Driving over Europe. Can't read the road map. Can't read the road signs. And everybody's going too fast. Um, any event, Reim, Reim Cathedral. Um, it, the, from the floor to the ceiling is 124 and a half feet. Once again, that is extremely high. Uh, I was impressed with Ram for a number of reasons. Obviously, it's drop dead gorgeous. Um,
But when Joan of Arc was getting the king to have himself coronated king, traditionally they were uh, coronated in, in this cathedral. And uh, so I walked in there and walked around the stones. Yes, Joan of Arc stood here. So I was impressed with that. The thing is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it has the stained glass windows. It has very high vaulting. You can see the exterior. It is one of the larger churches that uh, are in fact Romanesque. Excuse me, I said that wrong. They're in fact Gothic. Um, there's almost like a competition between communities. Beauvais is the choir. This is the highest point still exists but it was 158 feet. Some books say 157 and a half. I'm rounding up. 158 feet from the Fort of Sin. But the, the excuse me, the, the, the nave part of that still exists, but the choir collapsed in 1284. So what we have now is about, what, two-fifths of the original building. Well, let's show you what Beauvais even today looks like. I have not seen this one very much on my to-do list. You can see it is absolutely enormous. You can also see that part of the structure has collapsed. If we had a view from above, we would get a much better idea. So the effect is not as long in Beauvais, but the height is clearly there. If you go on the interior, you're talking 157 and a half, 158 feet. You go inside, and I can imagine the effect is absolutely enormous. You see, uh, when you walk into a Gothic cathedral, all the lines go up. Even the, even the pointed arch, the Gothic arch, goes up. And uh, can we say you go in, you look up? Of course, magnificence to see the stained glass windows. Magnificence to see the height. And uh, can we say that's turning your eyes and your thoughts upward? In other words, you're going thinking about our Lord and Savior, who happens to be in heaven. Well, I urge you when the, uh, to go to Europe if you ever get a chance and look for bargains, maybe hopefully you can find them. Uh, however, I would like to recommend those of you who do not have the opportunity to go to Europe for a while, that there are examples in the United States of magnificent Gothic architecture. Uh, one time I went to a convention in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Bethlehem is famous for it being a steel town, Bethlehem Steel. And uh, of course, you're not going to tie me down. I'm not going to stay in my lousy room. You know, when I'm not involved in the convention, I'm going to go out and do what I can. And I walked around all over. And it's remarkable. I was standing there at one point. And I looked up and going, my goodness, there's church, church, church. I mean, how many churches are you going to have in a city that's not terribly large? And uh, so anyway, I walk into the churches. Yeah, they're Gothic. And uh, I kept walking up to these other places. And I noticed, wait a minute, these are, these are universities. Um, and I'm going, dawns on me, wait a minute, I didn't know better than this. That a lot of times when they were building, like 100 years ago, when they were constructing universities, various places in the United States, that and building some of their buildings, they actually used the Gothic for study halls and libraries and administrative buildings. So uh, we do see it splashed around somewhat. However, I would like to give you some examples of where you can visit in the United States. That should take just a few minutes, but unfortunately, as I look at the clock, I think we're out of time. So let's hold that off for the next lecture. I will finish with that, and then I'll go on and talk about a few other things. In the meantime, whatever you're doing, I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope the weather is fantastic. I hope you're out enjoying everything, and we will see you again next time.